Welcome to Ideas Sunday. It's May 12th, 2019, Mother's Day. Once used for industry and agriculture, river dams are increasingly becoming obsolete, including here on the Cuyahoga. As the dams came down along the river, we saw that those fears did not come to fruition. It was a positive asset. We'll explore the impact of dams then and now. The world comes to Northeast Ohio as a global family of siblings. There is a lot to learn from each other and to grow together. Sister cities from around the globe gather in Cleveland. You're looking at the only natural population in the country of the Lakeside Daisy. This is kind of the ground zero for Lakeside Daisies in the United States, so it's pretty special to have. One of Ohio's most beautiful wildflowers and a threatened plant species. Ideas Sunday is next. Brought to you by Westfield. Offering insurance to protect what's yours, grow your business, and achieve your dreams. Good morning and happy Mother's Day. Thanks for joining us on Ideas Sunday. I'm Rick Jackson. A pretty big crowd turned out last month to watch the fourth annual Cuyahoga Falls Kayak Race. It's an event made possible only because in 2013, the Ohio EPA improved the river for kayakers by removing two dams on the Cuyahoga. The unexpected benefit, whitewater rapids. Our series Cuyahoga River Comeback continues now as Ideastream's Mark Uricki explores the impact of taking down those and other dams on the river and on the communities that border it. The biggest whitewater rapids in the Cuyahoga Falls race are right downtown in the shadow of the Sheridan Suites Hotel. Uh, the farthest person we've had travel by car is from Maine, maybe even Alabama. Uh, we did have a gentleman fly in from Washington State as well. Most of the old dams on the Cuyahoga were built to run mills. A couple generated electricity, but they haven't been actually working for decades. The idea of removing dams surfaced back in the mid-90s, but it was not about recreation. The Ohio EPA was studying the middle Cuyahoga between Kent and Cuyahoga Falls. They were trying to find out, after the big sources of pollution were cleaned up, why was the river not healthier? It was not meeting the standards for aquatic life, and um, most of the discharges in the area were pretty good. So um, they, they were wondering what was causing that, and the outcome of that study said that the major cause for aquatic life non-attainment, why the fish weren't healthy, was dams. And obviously stagnant water is never good. Uh, the sediment will drop out, which hurts the wildlife and all the breeding grounds, but also the water has to flow as nature intended to get oxygenated, so that was not happening. The Kent Dam was the first dam in the eastern United States that came out for water quality reasons, and it was the first dam in the state of Ohio that came out for other than safety reasons. So it was a new thing. Nobody knew what it was gonna look like. A lot of people liked the old historic dam. There was a debate that lasted seven years. We soon found out that uh, Kent, being the unique town that it is, has a very strong environmental presence, but we also had a very strong historical presence. And a lot of people that have grown up in Kent their entire lives, uh, they spent a lot of time around the Kent Dam as kids, and uh, they didn't want to see anything change down here. So we learned very early on that there was going to be two opposing forces here, the historians versus the environmentalists. The battle went on until a compromise was reached. Leave some of the dam as a water park and open up a side channel to let the river run free. Before this project, the water level would have been about right here, about 14 foot uh, above the river itself, and the water would be flowing over here. So when the dam pool was drained and, and this was, uh, park was added, uh, we got a lot more area for people to come down and visit and enjoy the area. The waterfall feature that uh, was so important to the citizens of Kent uh, had to be modified in order to keep some type of a waterfall. So what was done was there's actually a, a pump house built over there that has two 6,500 GPM pumps in it. With the dam pool gone and the river running free again, the water quality changed. Immediate difference. Um, it was pretty remarkable. We had our staff out there 
within six months to a year after the dam was, was removed, we did our uh, investigation into the biology of the former dam pool and showed that it was meeting our warm water criteria. Again, we, we had northern pike and smallmouth bass had, had come back to that dam pool that was di dominated by catfish and carp. Shortly after, downstream at about mile 50 on the 100-mile Cuyahoga, the Monroe Falls Dam was torn down with similar water improvements. Monroe Falls took a little longer. It's a different stretch of water, but uh, we most recently did our sampling in the Monroe Falls area, and it is, it is also uh, meeting our water quality objectives. In 2013, the two dams within sight of each other in downtown Cuyahoga Falls came under the hammer. One was the Powerhouse Dam at the site of today's Burntwood Tavern. The second was near the Sheridan Hotel, where the restaurant Bows on the River juts out over the water to embrace the view. New bars and restaurants and breweries are being built on the river to take advantage of that view. There was a lot of public concern uh, about what would happen, what it would look like, what it would do to the aesthetics, what it would do to the historic values. And there were a lot of people who were concerned about this, especially people who lived near the river. But as the dams came down along the river, we saw that those fears did not come to fruition. That instead of it impacting negatively the aesthetics and negatively their property, it was a positive asset. Prior to the dams coming down, we never really had a travel and tourism piece here. In fact, we don't have a travel and tourism director. I'll be that person. You know, it just keeps getting cleaner and cleaner. In the summertime when we run through here, um, you can see down six feet into some of, the, some of these areas very clearly. You can see all the way down to the river bottom. You can see fish swimming around. Um, and it's, it's great. So it doesn't surprise me at all that there's so many new buildings being put up here to embrace the river. The next dam expected to go is the Canal Diversion Dam, or Brexville Dam, in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. It was originally built in 1827 to provide water for the Ohio Canal, but now all it does is back up two miles of stagnant water. It's scheduled to come down this fall. What that's going to get us is the dam pool above there does not meet our warm water criteria, and I would point out that Below the dam pool, we are meeting exceptional warm water habitat, our criteria for the Cuyahoga River below that dam pool. That's the gold standard, the A+. Plus. That puts it on par with the Grand River and the Chagrin River. So we have no reason to expect that we're not going to have similar water quality improvements when we remove that dam. There is hope that um, a trout species would actually be able to go upstream into um, either Yellow Creek or Furnace Run and spawn. Um, there is a possibility that the Cuyahoga could become a trout stream. It's, it's going to allow fish passage. Also, um, those low head dams, they're a safety hazard. The Brexville Dam is a site where people have actually died. The same reason that that dam is a killer dam is the same reason why these waterfalls are dangerous at high water and they can't kill you. What happens is dams create them naturally, but when the river rises, it creates these river hydraulics that can continue to pull you underwater, but don't allow you to flush down river. So you end up being recirculated to the point of exhaustion and drowning. Um, and then the river will continue to hold you there until it either lowers or just time allows, allows debris or people to flush out. With the dam out of the way, canoers will be able to paddle a 40-mile stretch to Lake Erie, following the path Native Americans took centuries ago. When the Brexville Dam is gone, all eyes will be on the biggest dam on the river, the Gorge Dam, also known as the Edison Dam, connecting Akron and Cuyahoga Falls. Federal EPA is the big funder of that dam removal. We look like it could be on pace to about 2022 or 2023 to be totally gone. We knew that even though this dam is 60 feet high and 420 feet wide, that it was a big dam, but we also knew the most expense was gonna be in removing the sediment. We have to remove the sediment from behind a dam. That's in the neighborhood of 850,000 cubic yards of sediment. That's a huge volume of sediment. Um, and then we obviously have to remove the structure. We came up with 
a feasibility account of what it would take to take out this dam. And that report said it would cost in the neighborhood of $70 million to remove the dam and the contaminated sediment. So the dam was placed over to Great Falls. There's, depending on which elevations you look at, there's, there's like half of the Great Falls might still be buried by the dam. And what's it gonna look like? That's, it's the box of chocolates, who knows? The technical term is the Big Falls, but our city was named after that, and it hasn't been seen in over 100 years. When we took the two small dams down, the kayakers told me that's about a half mile of challenging whitewater. If the Edison Dam comes down, it's two and a half miles, and there's nothing even east of the Mississippi even close. You'd have to go out to the Colorado or Snake River. So we will be building hotels and restaurants at that point. It seems with clean water, things just seem to grow better. Mark's report is part of Ideastream's continuing coverage of the Cuyahoga River as the 50th anniversary of the 1969 fire that became such a turning point for our region and for the environmental movement approaches. Next week, I'm back on the water for the second part of my travels along the Cuyahoga, learning its history and its importance. We'll examine the methods we use to remove sewage, plus the beauty and changing uses of the river as it cuts through the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Here's a taste of what's to come. Next Sunday morning, we'll have the second part of our look at the Cuyahoga River, starting with the idea of water quality. Get a nice drippy one. Okay, so hold it up. So this is, so this that's is a flushable a, this wipe. This is a flushable wipe. So uh, flushable wipes are one of the biggest problems with the screens next to leaves in the fall because of the combined sewers. Um, they're non-dispersibles. They do not break down in the sewer system. You feel like people take you for granted? I don't know if people take us for granted, but I think a lot of people just don't know what it is that we do and what it takes, what it takes to treat what you flush down the toilet or put down your shower, or comes out of your washing machine. And then moving on to conservation. How do we keep this river as clean as possible? Dear mom, what I learned at Cuyahoga Valley National Park camp today is, according to my teacher, Chris Davis, once upon a time, that tree line there used to come all the way where we're standing, but people decided they needed the dirt for other things. They kept digging and digging and digging, taking it far away. Pretty soon the trees are back to there. We've got this bare, bare piece of land. Water is now running off of it like a parking lot into a stream that way, Chris, and this way. The water runs into the river, that's causing damage there. So the park acquires the property some 30 plus years ago and decides we need to fix this. You come in and pack the ground, but it packed it so well and so tight that nothing would grow. So now we're deciding to reforest the land. You bring in bulldozers, you're working with Kent State University, you dig all this down. You've been taking all these trees down here we see, planting these buckets full of trees along all those stripes there. Is it working? It is working. So this is the second site we're trying this at. The first site is working like gangbusters, the best survival we've ever had for trees. And this is only one year old, but so far we're seeing really good results. And finally, we'll look at recreation. People doing things on the river we'd have never thought of 20 years ago. Part of the excitement that's building around this Cuyahoga River water trail is a water trail is like a, you know, it's a trail on the river, but it's, it's a marked route for someone who wants to follow a, a waterway. Similar it's, to the Buckeye Trail. Huh? Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's signage safety information, maps, there'll be a website with an interactive map. And then a water trail also includes information about what to expect. You know, what kind of level of experience do I need to paddle this section of the river? So all of that information will be available. That's next week on Ideas Sunday. How many siblings do you have? Are you an only child or are you one of several kids in your family? 
As it turns out, Cleveland has nearly two dozen siblings, thanks to its Sister Cities program, which extends a hand to communities around the world. A sister city relationship matches two locales to create economic development opportunities, to raise cultural awareness, and to ease educational exchanges. This month, the world came to Northeast Ohio as Global Cleveland hosted its inaugural Sister Cities Conference. IdeaStream's Lisa Ryan attended this family reunion. Cleveland against the world. It's a popular saying in Northeast Ohio, but the Sister Cities Conference wants to change that mentality. In fact, Global Cleveland wants to show that Cleveland, along with its 23 other sister cities, is the world. Cleveland is a sister to cities like Alexandria, Egypt, Bratislava, Slovakia, Lima, Peru, and Taipei City, Taiwan. At first, Global Cleveland President Joe Simperman envisioned the Sister Cities event as a teleconference, using the power of technology to connect Cleveland to other countries. After all, the 23 sister cities span 13 time zones, 5 continents, and 19 languages. But when Simperman proposed the virtual meetup to his siblings around the world, the responses surprised him. Vogelgrad Russia said, well, we're just going to send a delegation. And then Bahardar Ethiopia said, we're going to send people from the embassy, but we're going to send people from Ethiopia. And then um, Lublana Slovenia said, well, we're going to send folks. And then we heard from people who were in Beit Shan, Israel, West Mayo, Ireland. And he was like, people are coming from all over the place. Of the 23 sister cities, about 18 participated, either through technology or in person. These delegates from sister city Volgograd, Russia, journeyed more than 5,000 miles to attend. People in Volgograd and in Cleveland have a lot in common. Both sides represent big industrial cities, relatively big, and um, they have a lot of common issues in social life, in education, politics. So there is a lot to learn from each other and to grow together. I think that we can, uh, we can exchange ideas, we can exchange, uh, uh, we can launch a cooperation between Mm, students exchanges, uh, business exchanges, um, cultural exchanges. There are many things uh, we may share. The conference included panels on broad topics like religion, education, economic development, and immigration, along with a chance to collaborate and share ideas on issues like how to develop an emergency response system in Ethiopia. We didn't have before 10 years a synchronized emergency medical service system. So I'm an anesthesia expert by profession, working in big teaching and referral hospital in Addis Ababa, seeing this very important problem for the community. So I sold my only house to buy ambulances and to be the first uh, social enterprise in Ethiopia. Social enterprise means uh, those people who see social problems and try to solve that social problem from innovation and entrepreneurship point of view with the business model. Simperman says the panels are important, but the true measure of success for the Sister Cities partnership is relationship building and networking. The spirit that we want to stress is that we're more connected than we think we are. And by using these sister cities as a real infrastructure, um, the city of Cleveland could benefit and so could the people in the city of Cleveland by experiencing more of the world. I don't think it would have mattered who was on the ballot. They've done the research. We're trying to get the truth so the public knows what's happening. Lawmakers established the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit 10 years ago to encourage the film industry to bring production to the state. It offers a 30% refund on cast and crew wages and other in-state spending, but there's disagreement between the Ohio House and Senate as to whether to keep the incentive in the state's budget. Now, supporters of the tax credit, including Cleveland State University, which just expanded its film school to the sixth floor of this building, say the state gets back the money it spends on the tax credit. 
A 2015 CSU study found that for every dollar spent by Ohio on the tax credit, filmmakers spend about two dollars. We discussed the tax credit and its impact in Northeast Ohio during our weekly Reporters Roundtable. Everyone um, wants um, a tax cut to pay um, less than you have to, but uh, this is where it hits close to home. This is where it gets real for Cleveland. Um, and, and, and it comes down to a question of dueling math. Whose numbers do you want to believe? Do you want to believe the numbers you know, put forward by the Cleveland State study or there's another study put out by um, uh, another progressive policy group, Policy Matters Ohio, that basically says that no, we end up paying more for the tax cut. For me personally, this is one of those creative parts of Cleveland that's emerging, that's attracting millennials, that's attracting entrepreneurial artist types to the city. I mean, it's, it's the kind of buzz that, uh, that goes with a new film school, that goes with um, uh, the, the idea that this is a location that's uh, hospitable to making a film. I mean, we'll never be confused for Hollywood East, but I, I believe Cleveland is emerging as a market that a lot of people are uh, seriously considering. Do we lose hope of getting major productions like The Avengers if we lose this credit? I, you know, it, it, it remains to be seen. I mean, fortunately, there are, I believe there are people out there who understand that Cleveland is, is a great place to come and film, to work. Uh, we, we have the talent here. We have the resources. But at the same time, uh, we know that the industry is very competitive and they're always looking for these breaks that a lot of other states will offer. Mm -hmm. It becomes like a lot of other incentives. I mean, I think uh, the question is, do you want to unilaterally disarm, essentially? As Philip said, most, a lot of other states have fairly extensive film tax credits. And one of the things that was made by the people who, be, who advocated for this, beginning with Chris Carmody when he was at the Film Commission and now Ivan Schwartz, is this is kind of, this is the table stakes, is you have to get there. The other point that they make is, unless the movies or television miniseries, whatever it might happen to be, actually comes and does business in your state, there's no, if the money wasn't spent in the first place, there's nothing to give back. Mm -hmm. So, and so if you end up ahead, you know, isn't that better on overall because people have worked, like Philip said, you develop this, uh, this cadre of, of creative work people who can then move on to other things. The, the difficulty with any incentive is trying to decide at what point don't you need it anymore. Do you have, re have you reached a point where your industry can be sort of self-sustaining with maybe either no or, or, or minimal incentive? Right. Karen wanted to jump in. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't think the battle over this is over. I mean, on the same day that the House passed, it's either the day that the House committee passed the budget that cut the film tax credit or the House, the full House passed the budget that cut the film tax credit. Over in the Senate, they were actually making some changes to the existing film tax credit, not increasing it, but allowing it to be used on theatrical productions and kind of tightening the rules on it to make sure that it's used in the time frame that they want it to be used in. So I think with Matt Dolan from Northeast Ohio, who's the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, and with what happened over in the Senate, I think there may try, I think senators may be looking at an effort to try to restore it. I don't know if they are, but that's just, you know, a sense that I get from all that I'm hearing here and, and what's been happening. So this will be something that's definitely one to watch as the budget goes into the Senate now and we start the hearings over there. In February of 1968, following a turbulent period of uprisings and conflict, President Lyndon Johnson's National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders released what became known as the Kerner Report. It illustrated the country's economic and social division and concluded the nation was, quote, moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. The Milton S. Eisenhower Foundation released its update of the Kerner Commission last year on the report's 50th anniversary. Dr. Alan Curtis, president and CEO of the Eisenhower Foundation, spoke at the City Club of Cleveland last week on the lack of progress and on what needs to change if our nation's to live up to its ideals. The Kerner Commission released its final report early in 1968. Dr. King and Senator Kennedy then endorsed that report very shortly after. A month after that, Dr. King was killed on April 4th, 1968. Uh, out on the presidential campaign trail and in Indianapolis that day, Senator Kennedy announced to the Indianapolis gathering that Dr. King had been assassinated. The very next day, Senator Kennedy presented here at the City Club. He was killed two months later in Los Angeles. And in November of 1968, 
the nation elected a law and order president who rejected the recommendations of the Kerner Commission. Although most of those Kerner Commission members were white men who wore the imprimatur of the political establishment, the original 1968 Kerner Report concluded that the nation had a long way to go in reducing poverty, inequality, and racial injustices. Do you see any substantive change in leadership at the state, city, national level, or grassroots engagement that give you any hope that change is possible, that the commission's um, recommendations are actually going to be implemented. My sense is that, I won't go 50 years from now, but 25 years from now, my, my sense is that at the 75th anniversary of the Kerner Commission, if, if Dan, uh, who will then be 50 years old, uh, <laughs> uh, wants to invite me back, uh, we, we'll, have the, we'll have the same discussions. Um, there were leaders, uh, President Johnson's programs uh, were going in the right direction in terms of my uh, values, but he, he got off track because of, of, of the war. Uh, there have been some presidents in recent years who I think have made uh, some progress, but frankly, I don't see these issues being discussed now by the people who will be running for president in the general election. So I, I'm, not, I'm not that optimistic right now, but what can we all do? What can you all do? Uh, we, can, we can become sheep farmers in New Zealand, uh, or we can, we can fight the good fight. We can push the rock uphill or use any metaphor you, you want. I, I think we have to especially pass the baton on to, to the, these young people here and, and to let them know that um, there is uh, a continuity in terms of discussing what happened, the existence of evidence now, the need to scale it up, and the need to create new will. You're watching Ideas Sunday. I'm Rick Jackson. Thanks for spending part of your morning with us. Still to come, a violin bow is more than an accessory. We'll visit a bow making shop in Ashland where the art of constructing a bow by hand runs in the family. But first, today we observe Mother's Day. The National Retail Federation estimates we'll spend $25 billion on gifts for our moms and a big chunk of those sales will be on flowers. Mother's Day itself initially became an American and Canadian holiday due to the campaigning of a woman named Anna Jarvis, a 19th century social reformer. Our own Stephanie Jarvis, no relation as far as we know, produced a different story though, about a rare Ohio wildflower that you can't find for mom in any store. The lakeside daisy is so rare that the Marblehead Peninsula along Lake Erie is one of the few places on earth where this flower blooms. Across this stretch of land in Marblehead, Ohio, patches of bright yellow blooms bask in the sunshine. Though similar in appearance to dandelions, these flowers, known as lakeside daisies, are anything but common. In the United States, you know, there, there's historical populations in Illinois, um, but those have been gone and reintroduced, and there's a um, small population in Michigan. Uh, but in Ohio, you know, this is kind of the ground zero for lakeside daisies in the United States, so it's pretty special to have. Ryan Schrader is the Northwest Regional Preserve Manager for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Natural Areas and Preserves. He oversees the Lakeside Daisy State Nature Preserve on the Marblehead Peninsula in Ottawa County, home to the only natural population of lakeside daisy in the country. That's because it takes a special habitat to allow the daisy to thrive. It flourishes under direct sunlight in a landscape of limestone bedrock. Lakeside Daisy is restricted to uh, limestone barren prairies and alvars. 
Um, and this habitat is very rare, restricted to on the Great Lakes. You know, the, at the beginning of the spring, you know, it's getting the sun and it, there's still moisture in the ground. So the plants will have enough nutrients and water to produce blooms and set seed. A solitary flower blooms atop a single leafless stalk, six to 11 inches tall. The daisies blanket the preserve in yellow, reaching peak bloom in mid-May. In 1988, the same year the state acquired the preserve, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service listed the lakeside daisy as a federally threatened species. It's considered endangered in Ohio. In this 19-acre lakeside daisy preserve, we have estimated well over a million individual plants. Now that sounds like, well, how can that be endangered? You know, it's, there's a lot of plants, and there is, but it's endangered because it, the habitat is so rare. You know, if this preserve wasn't here, was destroyed for some reason, you know, we would lose almost, you know, a big chunk of the population. Last week, protection for this population of lakeside daisy expanded to include an additional 118 acres adjacent to the preserve's current space. During the dedication ceremony, Governor Mike DeWine uh, said he first learned about the lakeside daisy lakeside. 25 years ago when his son John interned with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. He points to the preserve as one of many hidden gems in the state. It's very, very important. It's important for biodiversity. It's important for, frankly, for people to be able to come out and see something that is, uh, they can't see any place else in the United States, but right here. The new addition was purchased with 75% grant money from the federal government, but also 25% from our uh, state tax checkoff program. Um, that's money that you might choose to donate when you get your state income taxes. And we'll use that money to help protect areas like this. And the expanded 137-acre State Nature Preserve includes more than just daisies. You know, not only that are we protecting uh, lakeside daisies on our, our new parcel that we're purchasing, but there's also existing uh, natural alvar with glacial grooves and glacial striations that have been unquarried. So they're, they're original uh, alvar habitat, which is very rare now that you know most of our limestone has been quarried away so it's really cool to protect these natural areas how the united states and canada benefit from great lakes commerce trade and investment the next steps following release of proposals to attack the city's lead poisoning problem, and it's much ado about something as a Hawkins School senior wins the National High School Shakespeare competition. Those are among the stories discussed this past week on The Sound of Ideas. I think when you look at Ohio, when you look at the eight Great Lakes states and uh, combine that with Ontario and Quebec, this region really is the heart and soul of the United States-Canada relationship uh, economically, but also in terms of the way that we look at the Great Lakes as a, a globally significant uh, environmental resource and what we do to protect the Great Lakes for future generations. You know, I think what people forget is when you put that region together as, a, as 10 jurisdictions, it represents roughly a $6 trillion economy. Yeah, it's U.S. dollars. Uh, that would be the third largest economy in the world behind the United States and China. So it's an economic powerhouse and very much the uh, economic engine of North America. I think a really big part of understanding Shakespeare and really appreciating Shakespeare is finding the relatability in the characters because I think his characters, also his intriguing plots, is what made him a staple for hundreds and hundreds of years. So once you understand the basis of the words and the plot, taking a deep dive into character analysis can really be fulfilling. I think it's really important for every individual to claim it. There are things that you can do in your life. You can become informed, you can vote, you can adjust your consumptive habits, you can support conservation organizations like the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo or the Museum of Natural History, but you can get involved and in that collectively we can have an impact. And of course the importance of this report is that it brings biodiversity and our relationship relationship to nature to the fore and I think it's something everyone should think about. I think we need to also talk about as we work on these policies and approaches just like screening, once we screen a, a lot more children we still have to think about the source. If there are poisonings that come up or increase, where are they getting poisoned? So we need to focus on the housing as a comprehensive strategy. So daycares and could could be considered maybe in another 
a round of discussions. Mm. But as far as engagement, we can touch everyone through a, a engagement strategy on the ground. There's so much pressure, I think, that people feel both married and single for everything to be pretty you know that you look on the internet there's no bad smells on the internet <laughs> right um, everyone always shows themselves having a good hair day and it's easy to feel like you are the only one who is messing up and this book it, I just want it to be a hug to everyone out there who feels like they're failing and tomorrow on the sound of ideas the plan to consolidate government into one regional umbrella in st. Louis fell apart last week what will that do to those who dream of a unigovernment government in Northeast Ohio Plus, a look at lunch debt. What happens when a student runs up the lunch tab? As always, we invite you to join the conversation. Talk to you tomorrow. There's lots more next week on The Sound of Ideas, of course. On Thursday, Mike takes the show to Slavic Village for a live broadcast from Bob and Sherry's 49er Diner. Mike and his guest will preview the university settlement's upcoming Homecoming Weekend, a celebration of community revitalization aimed at bringing together those with ties to Slavic Village. We ask the settlement's executive director, Earl Pike, for a sneak peek at the festivities. This community, Slavic Village, used to be 100,000 people. Right at the end of World War II, there was 100,000 people. And because of job losses and other factors, over time, that population moved south into other communities. It got poorer and poorer and poorer over time, and we're now left with about 22,000 people. So Slavic Village is now arguably one of the poorest communities in the state. It has a poverty rate of about 60%. It has a deep poverty rate, and deep poverty means half the poverty rate of about 25%. Deep poverty is about $6,000 a year, so 25% of this community lives on about $14 a day. So the idea of homecoming is sort of twofold. One is we want to bring back some of those folks who left to get them to reimagine the community and its possibilities rather than its losses. And we want to introduce Slavic Village to folks who have never been here before. So it's a rich community, as you can see, with lots of institutions and lots of assets that people really deserve to see. Saturday night, we're doing, in this, in this hall, um, we're doing a community dance. That, we want to attract everybody. We want folks to come from their houses within 10 blocks. And we intentionally uh, sought out Lou Ragland, who is a, he's a well-known soul singer back in the day in Cleveland, played in a lot of East Side clubs. <laughs> We have a movie night, community movie night, completely free, at the velodrome right next door, outdoor movie. We'll have popcorn, we'll have demonstrations of how the velodrome works. That's for the entire community. And again, we want families to come and bring their blankets and sit in the velodrome and watch movies together. I'm hoping that everybody walks away from whatever event they attend. One is that there is more potential in Slavic Village than I had realized. There is more going on here than, than I knew, and it's exciting to see. The other thing I would like folks to walk away with is a commitment on some level to be part of that process, to be part of the process of renewal in this community. There's a, there's a role for everybody to play, volunteering, donating, whatever it might be. I want people to recommit to the survival and the well-being of this community. The way we envisioned it is if it's homecoming, if this is our home and we want you to come home, homecoming weekend will open all of the doors. And you might come in through this door, you might come in through this door, you might come in th through this door, but our home is open to you. Remember those magnificent eagles we introduced you to on this show two weeks ago? Well, they're not alone, and May is prime birding season all along the Lake Erie shore. From McGee Marsh in Ottawa County, built as the warbler capital of the world, to Headlands Beach State Park, 30 miles east of Cleveland, birders and binoculars are everywhere these days. But one of the best spots to see birds of all sizes and colors is in Lake County, where the Cleveland Museum of Natural History has restored a birding boardwalk. In this Ideas Encore, we take you to the Wake Robin Trail, located just south of Mentor Headlands in the Mentor Marsh. <laughs> We 
are in Mentor Marsh. Mentor Marsh is a pretty cool place. This is a museum natural area, but also a state dedicated nature preserve. And it's over 800 acres of wetlands that have recently undergone amazing restoration. And as you look around you, you see this land of water um, and we have this wonderful morning mist that's starting to burn off. And you can hear a whole variety of birds that are occupying this wetland. When we look at the marsh now, it looks similar to the way it looked originally when it was acquired. In 1959, there was a development plan to develop this marsh uh, into a big marina. And so a local nature club, the John Burroughs Nature Club, brought to the attention of the museum. And the museum, along with uh, some partners like the Black Brook Bird Club and the Nature Conservancy, started a campaign to buy up all the parcels in the marsh. In 1966, a football field-sized pile of low-grade rock salt got moved from the nearby Morton Salt Facility to a creek called Black Brook, that same creek from Black Brook Audubon. And the museum's phones went off the hook. Hey, the marsh is dying, the marsh is dying. And within two years, dead, just dying, just leaves were dying. And at the same time, our highways were being built, and in jumps this non-native plant called Phragmites. Phragmites, or common reed, that can grow to be 10 to 15 feet tall. And it grows as a thick vegetative mat, and in a few years, it basically occupied the entire marsh, totally changed the marsh. And a lot of folks thought that that was the death knell for the marsh, that it was lost forever to these invasive species. And it just created a perfect tinderbox. And so the marsh has burned a about a dozen times with large fires. The last big one was in 2003, and it burned this boardwalk, the Wake Robin boardwalk that we're standing on. It made international news. Museum members in South Korea saw it. The smoke went up about 3,000 feet, a black plume that coated sh nearby Chardon 20 miles away with soot and all the cars. But there's been an exciting new program instituted over the last five years that's basically brought the marsh back. At that point, that's when the museum was like, Ugh. we had to replace this $86,000 boardwalk, and we're like, well, why don't we push this Phragmites back away from the boardwalk? And out of the soil seed bank, the very next year, all these native plants popped up. And that's that phoenix rising from the ashes moment, that aha, we're like, hey, there's some hope here. We'd used an aquatic approved herbicide, and in the very next season, in shows up these leopard frogs. And so we knew that we were onto something. And so we started to figure out how could we do such a huge project. This is nearly four miles long. It's almost 800 acres of Phragmites. We used something called a Marshmaster. It's a 6,000 pound amphibious tank that essentially just floats. It's got big aluminum tracks and it, we came out here and we mashed around the perimeter and you can see the results. We've got the Phragmites down. We've got about 60 species of native plants coming out of the soil seed bank. And it's this classic story of build and they'll come and the Phragmites is gone. The native plants are coming up. Everything you see here is coming out of the soil seed bank and the birds have just loved it. rails and bitterns and sandhill cranes and all these other birds showing up. Some are nesting, some are using it as stopover habitat. You can hear them in the background there. The birding is great here year round. It's, it's hot over the winter too. This is great stopover habitat for a lot of birds that are moving their way um, north to their breeding grounds in Canada, but also then the ones that are, are moving south also. So particularly right now we've got um, good shorebirds and some of our songbirds that are moving through. Um, but a lot of these birds nest here also, so we'll have views of the young throughout the, the rest of the early summer. Um, it's great birding all the time, even in the middle of the day. Typically people say morning birding is the best. At Menor Marsh it's hot all day during this you know, really great birding season. <laughs> What
what's a violin without its bow? In the latest installment of Making It, Ideastream series about Northeast Ohio entrepreneurs, we meet Ashland residents Rodney and Kate Moore, a father-daughter duo bound by blood and a shared love of bow making. A lot of people have referred to them as their magic wand. It's a very refined art. That's magical. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rodney Moore. Hi, I'm Kate Moore. I'm a violin bow maker. And I'm a bow maker. As a youngster, I was always making things. About the time I graduated from high school, I found out about a school in Chicago for violin making. He's really put in his time, and now I'm learning from one of the best. Making an instrument is just a higher level of craftsmanship. I noticed that there weren't a lot of people that interested in bows, so I started to play around with them a little bit. So this is my dad's first bow, octagonal. It's still the original hair. A lot of people think of bows as accessories, but a really fine bow almost plays itself. He's made over a thousand bows. I probably have a bow in every major orchestra in the United States. He's got such an impressive resume. On top of that, he's a great teacher. Like a lot of crafts, it's been dominated by men, but recently there have been quite a few women bow makers that have come along and they're quite good. But I was working at the UPS store. But one of her friends actually challenged her. She's like, your dad's like a rock star. Why would you want to work at the UPS store when you could be doing this? You have to have a really fine eye for detail, and Kate has that. I picked it up a whole lot faster than I was expecting. One thing that's often common is that the student will make pretty much exact copies of what you're doing. She has no interest in that. My first bow has a different head shape. It has a different camber, which is the curve and the stick. Kate's really gotten to the point now where she's teaching herself. She's showing me things. What do you think of this? She's becoming a real thinking bow maker. So here, you want to see this? This is really cool. So this has spots in it. The French bow makers don't like that, which is fine, because that means there's all these sticks that are still left for me to use. When we make the bow, we actually heat the wood and bend it. It will retain that curve for 100 years. Another wood that we use is ebony, and it's used for this little part here. It's called the frog. It is sort of the handle. It holds the hair. This is actually horse hair. You can turn this, it's called the button, and it will actually adjust the length of the hair. I love doing this work. People don't really understand that a machine is not making them. They're made by hand. As I get older, it would be really nice to not have to use my hands all the time to do some of the work. But there's something really special about a bow that's made completely by hand. You kind of impart a soul into it as you're working on it. It's really pretty amazing. Thanks to Ideastream's Jeff Haynes and David C. Barnett for that story. Ideastream has been honored with both a National Gabriel Award and a regional Emmy nomination for a story we first brought you last spring. On February 19, 1942, just 10 weeks after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which eventually allowed the U.S. government to relocate more than 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry to internment camps. The reasoning? Because they looked like and shared heritage with the enemy, they needed to be confined for reasons of national security. Two-thirds of those rounded up were American citizens. Oberlin, Ohio became a refuge of sorts for a group of Japanese American students who were permitted to leave internment camps and attend college there. At a special reunion 75 years later, we met Alice, who shared her experiences as a Japanese American student during that turbulent time, and told us how music helped her persevere. You know, my, my swan song was my 50th reunion here at Oberlin. So that was supposed to be the last time that I would perform. And so I stopped performing. But um, I'm playing with such excellent faculty that, that I just hope I don't mess it up. 91-year-old Alice Takamoto rehearses with faculty members at the Oberlin Conservatory of Music, ahead of a recital honoring Japanese-American students who attended Oberlin during World War II. Three quarters of a century ago, Alice was a 16-year-old girl with a dream and the determination not to become a victim of her circumstances. 
Then, as now, her artistry prevailed. Alice, the youngest of four daughters, remembers being a teenager when the war broke out, forced from her community in Norwalk, California, into an assembly camp in Santa Anita, before eventually being moved to a relocation camp in Arkansas. I blocked out so much of Arkansas, I think because it was an unhappy time. The wartime was very difficult to explain how, how we as a minority felt. And, and being put into the camp, I thought maybe there was a reason for it. Maybe I did something wrong. I was very unhappy uh, because I didn't know anybody. My whole community went to another camp in Arkansas. So there I was with no friends. And there was no, of course there's no newspaper, no magazine, no radio, no TV, no library. And the school was just miserable. At just 16 years old, Alice left Arkansas with her sister Grace after gaining acceptance as a student at Oberlin. Once the government decided that we were not dangerous, now they wanted us to leave. I was a very immature 16 year old with no social graces, and uh, I was really scared. Alice came to Oberlin in 1943 as a conservatory student, studying the piano. Her story now being presented along with photos, artifacts, and essays of the nearly 40 Japanese American students who came to the school during the course of the war. This is a project that they've been working on, so for over two years and we just saw it this morning. And uh, what I'm very pleased is to have school children come to visit and to learn something about what's happened. Uh, These students' stories, once a mostly forgotten footnote in history, are being told and celebrated through a national traveling exhibit called Courage and Compassion, our shared story of the Japanese American World War II experience. At its stop in Northeast Ohio, Oberlin, with its proud history as a haven for the oppressed, shares its role in providing a refuge and an education to students like these. And this is really a moment where a community stood up and said, we don't need to racially profile an entire group of people in order to achieve our national security. That is not the right way to do that, right? It is not the right way to protect this country. And in fact, it violates the ideals that this country stands for and is, are, are in our constitution. Rene Romano, history professor at Oberlin College, combed through the school's archives to help tell these stories, and in the process began to understand the weight carried by these young students. When they got here, what they found, I think, is not a perfect community, but one where they could really make a home. So they were able to walk around town, they got involved in student organizations, they became campus leaders, many of them. Kenji Akuda, who was a student at the University of Washington when the war broke out, was elected student body president within a month of arriving on Oberlin's campus. But for others like Alice, the adjustment from camp to college life took a little longer. I remember when I walked into any class, I couldn't converse with people and it was very hard for me to make friends. I felt like I was out of place and I did not feel, actually, you know, I was not comfortable in my own skin, too, so. Alice found comfort in her music and the Worcester family who took her in during her junior year. That, that was the sanctuary. My, that, they, that was my family there because my parents were in camp. The Worcester family, Patty is here, they were just wonderful to me and I, I can't express how important they were uh, in, at, at that time of my life. I think that, that it's, our situation was very relevant to what is happening now. At the time of the war, there was such fear of the, the Japanese people as a whole that I think there was a lot of propaganda and, and to not let the story be known. So I think the more people know about, a lot of people don't know about what's happened to us. And I know that uh, until very recently, you know, my age group, uh, 
people in, on the East Coast, they didn't know. They didn't know this story. And of course, I just hope that it doesn't happen again to another group of people. With her son and grandson in attendance, along with members of the Worcester family, Alice hit the final notes in a performance both flawless and unforgettable. seeing that again. Well, that's going to do it for us for this morning. Up next, the state of Ohio with Karen Kassler. Thank you so much for watching and happy Mother's Day to all moms across Northeast Ohio. I'm Rick Jackson. Brought to you by Westfield, offering insurance to protect what's yours, grow your business, and achieve your dreams.